we're going to try to try to see what we can do. So, I mean, again, I'm taking a little break from the, our typical study um, until I run out of something to say about the Sukkot Sukkot's holiday. <laughs> so, I mean, the first thing I wanted to bring up is, is um, in terms of the theme and, and the reason also, remember I've always said in the past is that even for different commandments that are discussed in the Hebrew Bible and the, the Torah that are directed specifically to the children of Israel, what's now known as the Jewish people, um, but we can learn lessons, right? And I think that's important to do and a good to do. And um, and sukkah is a, is a tremendous a tremendous lesson. I mean, sukkah I think is is again has something to do with something very fundamental for Noahites, and that is faith. I mean, the basic and, and more than that, trust. I mean, the basic idea of sukkah. It says that the sukkah represents the clouds of glory, and this is the traditional, um, you know the view of the Midrash of, of our sages of the Mishnah and Talmud that the, I mean, there's actually two opinions. One opinion in, in the Talmud, in Talmud Sukkah, is that it's the cloud, represents the clouds of glory. The other opinion is it's literally were similarly um, uh, constructed booths that the Jewish, the children of Israel constructed in the desert. So those are the two opinions. The opinion that we seem to adopt uh, primarily is the first one that the that the uh, sukkah represents the clouds of glory, or protected the children of Israel through their sojourn in the desert. And it talks about it actually in one of the I think I'm trying to think in which parasha it may have been in in Itzavim, but. Uh, Towards the last half of Deuteronomy, it's it's mentioned that it says that Moses tells the people that your feet did not swell and your clothing did not become worn all the years in the desert. And that was because of the clouds. The clouds were able to keep things moist under their feet and protect them from, you know, from the sun and, and, and the elements. So that's something fantastic. But so what's interesting about this mitzvah is it represents both the idea how you can rely on God in a similar way that the children of Israel, that he provided everything to the children of Israel. But it's also the idea, the mitzvah of sukkah, though, if you think about it, it doesn't appear like clouds, right? I mean, obviously. The mitzvah seems to represent, even though, again, our sages say it represents the clouds, but that's one aspect of it but the other aspect is we're building it and that to me seems to represent and we're sitting in it that represents the fact the part of it that god takes so much pride in and as it says in jeremiah in one of the first chapters when i remembered the loving kindness you did for me when you followed me into the desert in other words, the heroic act, the act of leap of faith, that an entire people just went into the desert without sufficient provisions. And, you know, I mean, because to go into a desert with just provisions for a couple of days, it's not really, I mean, that's that's a leap of faith. That's a big one because there's nothing out there. People who go like that, you know, they die out there. So... So that's something that was God remembers eternally. The fact that the the people, you know, took that leap, that they took they took those steps into the wilderness, is one way of saying it. But it's a desert. It was a desolate place where there wasn't natural resources to provide. Not only that, there were dangerous, you know, there was snakes and scorpions that also are mentioned in in the Bible that were present there. It's a dangerous place. <clears throat> so, yet the people went there. So it's kind of like, so it basically this is the lesson. And maybe after this, you know, the, set, the, the lecture is over. No, we'll see if we could do some same additional things too. But the point is, is this, the big lesson is, is that you, we take the step 
we take this leap of faith. We basically take a risk in listening to what God asks us, wants from us. And in return, he protects us. I mean, that's the basic structure of this mitzvah and what, what, the, what the Jewish people are representing by performing this and, and reenacting the mitzvah of sukkah. That all the nations should see this, the idea that they, and similarly reenacted, that they're leaving their home, going out into the elements, and also at a time where generally around the world, it's not, the weather is not so good for that kind of uh, activity. And they're relying upon God. So they're taking a risk and they're, they're, they're leaving themselves vulnerable to the elements. Again, the, the roof of the sukkah has to be such that the rain can come through. What does that mean? I mean, it has a lot of meanings, obviously. We can't come to the depths of the, the commandments of God. But in terms of what little bit we can understand in a simple way is that a person is left vulnerable at the end of the day. Even after he has the sukkah there, he's still relying on God anyway. You know, and similarly, the people every single day, it's an interesting thing about a miracle is that you never get comfortable with it. You know, for 40 years, they had these clouds, but every day they woke up and maybe I drew this. I don't know this for sure, but, you know, they may never, they may never, never have fully felt like we're OK. For example, the point is like the man. We see this in the man, actually, exactly. The people, there was something about it, even though it came, it fell every single day, but its unnatural quality set was very uncomfortable for many of the masses of people. They just, it was a, some, because it was a miraculous, they, they wanted food. That's why they, they complained about it. And that was a sin to complain about. But at the same time, it was, you know, because of, because of a, a, a spiritual deficiency that they, and lack of faith and so on. It, you know, why didn't they want to connect to the spiritual side of the mind? But the human part of them was just like, we just want, you know, we want food. And we want, you know, to say it in the current vernacular, it's like, I want a nice size savings account. I want my 401k. You know, I want my house paid off. I don't want you to tell me that you're a God and you're going to take care of it. I want to see it. <laughs> you know, it, so, so, but that, that's a lack of faith, you know, but it's not an unnatural thing for a person to feel. But you can't exercise faith in the same way when you have all those things. And that's the idea of the sukkah is your person is put to the test of faith. Person is in a vulnerable position. God could make it rain. You may, things may not go so good. You may, you may have to leave the sukkah. Right. But the point is we're going out there and it's similar with being a farmer, maybe like being a rancher. I don't know, I don't know enough about ranching. And I mean, it's simple in terms of farming, Person is dependent on the elements and on the weather, which more directly is, you know, clearly, you know, from the hand of God. And today, obviously, through science, it's, you know, humankind tries to manipulate that and control that, etc. <clears throat> but in its pure form, what I'm guessing, on what I'm trying to tell you, is that the Jewish people, there's a certain message here of, of the value of vulnerability. There's a certain value in it. And what's that value? The value is, is you're in a special relationship with God because you're saying, look, I'm, I'm just relying on you. I don't have other things. I don't have, you know, the circumstances otherwise. And um, to a great extent, and it's interesting, there's actually a Yiddish song about this. To a great extent, the Jewish people throughout history have been in this precarious situation. In other words, at least since they've been in exile. Maybe you could argue even before, but certainly since they've been in exile, they've been in a precarious, they've been basically in a sukkah. And there's a Yiddish song that says basically the same thing, that the Jewish people are like a sukkah in a stormy rain. You know, and the, the, the roof is shaking and the walls are, the roof is fluttering and the walls are shaking, you know. And it's just been so long in the exile. When is it going to come to an end? It's kind of, it's a little bit of a sad song. 
But, it, but I think the point is clear that um, the children of Israel and the exile are vulnerable. They're different than everyone. They have different beliefs. And obviously, and so in a certain extent, they may seem, they may make other people uncomfortable, feel threatened for various reasons. One is, again, ideologically, they have very different beliefs, and yet they succeed, and that becomes very threatening. You know, and that's a promise, obviously, that God made to the Jewish people. Uh, also, it says it's, it's one of them. I think also in Itzavim, I think it says that there. Uh, or maybe it's in Ki Tavo, Ki Savo. I think it's in there where God says in, in, during the rebuke that even when you're among the nations, I will, in the exile, I'm going to still look after you. Um, I'm not going to completely, um, you know, uh, rebuff you, reject you. So there's still divine protection in the exile. And that brings about a situation in which the Jewish people are able to thrive very often in the exile, at least to a certain extent. And so you have a, a kind of a paradigm in which the general population uh, have different beliefs and ones that they believe are you know, right and like everybody's doing it. And then you have this minority that are doing things really, really differently and yet still seem to succeed. And so that's very threatening. Because it threatens the it threatens their whole foundation of their belief system. It threatens their how do I say you know their whole worldview, their whole perception of themselves as being the way to go. You know we the way we think is how a person lives and succeeds, and then these other people are doing a different thing and they're doing okay. That could be that could that could be very threatening, and that causes antagonism. <clears throat> And it's only through really God's, you know, providence and supervision that the Jewish people avoid a lot of, how shall I say, a lot, a lot of, uh, as I said, antagonism and, and a lot of um, hatred, maybe a lot of um, Well, a very uh, a style. Hello, hello. All right, there I am again. Hello. Yes, we can hear, hear you. you. Oh, all right, because I wasn't. Cool. Oh boy. Okay. Um, was I was I on tape? Yeah, I think I was. Oops. Okay. Um, so the point is, but it creates a it could create a hostile antagonism. Um, so, but the point is that creates this vulnerability. I mean, obviously, just being different alone puts you in a vulnerable state. Just being different because. You're the other. You're the you're the the minority other who's very different, and so the people, the majority, don't um, they don't empathize. How do I say they with you? They don't they don't you know see themselves as being as unified with you. So therefore, they can let things out on you. Basically, they can they can blame you because you're not them. You know, people just by nature blame the other guy for their for problems or, or more critical when they when you look at yourself in the mirror you don't see anything wrong and similarly you know a nation itself if things are they have this frustration so there's this very immature and and um wrong you know an immoral tendency but it's there to blame the other one to blame the other one not not yourself, not not them, themselves, and so that's something obviously that happened for you know many many centuries, and I guess maybe still happens and still happens today. Even here in the United States, there are higher numbers they say than people may realize of people who are quite anti-Semitic, actually, <laughs> from what I understand. 
So, <clears throat> but that's kind of what the sukkah represents. It represents being vulnerable, being almost in danger, and yet relying on God and also yet surviving. And that's obviously a way in which God can show his miraculous providence in the world. Of course, you have to have a very discerning eye to see this. It's not something a lot of people, many people, most people won't notice it. But um, that doesn't mean that's not what God's trying to do. I mean, um, if people don't want to hear messages of truth, that's not God's fault. You know? So... But let's get back to, so this is, so that's an important point also, because it's something that even not just to know, it's interesting, actually, that lesson goes beyond just the Noahide, meaning someone who's trying to keep the seven laws. It goes through all the nations. It's a lesson that they will eventually learn. Um, it's actually a Rashi recently, and I think last week's Parsha that says that at the end of days, you know, the nations will praise the Jewish people for clinging to God throughout the long exile, despite many challenges and suffering and so on. It's a little bit related to what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is actually has a lot more to do with the question that, that so many Christian thinkers asked over the centuries, Pascal, uh, but there are many others. What is it with these people? Like if you know, according to Christianity, they were rejected by God. Why are they still here? Why, why over all these years, they're still around? If they're, if, 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 you know, they're no longer, if they were no longer chosen, God forbid. So it's uh, so fascinating that even, you know, even Christians had this dilemma and they did pick up on it. You know, that there's something very, that something miraculous is going on here, something, something special. And, um, you know, one of the approaches was, as you're probably familiar, one of the approaches was, well, the one, the approach of those who were anti-Semitic Christians, I guess you could say. Or anyway, one of the ways they dealt with this, the rationalization, you may want to say, one way of dealing is that Jewish people are being kept you know, as to bear witness somehow to, in other words, to continuously be punished. Like they're on one hand, they're eternal. On the other hand, they're eternally going to be punished and suffer. So in other words, so it's kind of like basically the, the persecution that many Christian monarchies or, you know, section, many sections of the church um, put upon the Jewish people, then they just turned it around. And they said this was something that was divinely uh, decreed. Now, I always find that interesting. You know, they're basically they say, yeah, they're still around, but they're here to be a witness by their suffering that they're rejected. So they're here to show that they aren't wanted anymore. I don't know why. Maybe I shouldn't be getting into all this in the Torah. <laughs> It's, more, it's a little more historical than it is Torah. Um, so I'll get I'll, let me let me get off get, get off of this. But my point was to show you that this point was something that even a non-believing Gentile picks up on. That's really was my point. And I, and and it's not obviously surprising that 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 Christians and Christian thinkers picked up on this because obviously they are connected to the. Jewish Bible through their the Old Testament, as they call it, as and so there's a sensitivity to awareness of you know the chosenness and so on and so forth, and and so you know, they're paying attention enough to see that there's something a problem, but again it comes down to the same thing where the Jewish people became a threat. It's like their their the eternal quality really was just a slap in the face. Of Christian thinking, and yet there's still, you know, in other words, if, if like the two statues of the victorious Christendom that's found in in one of the churches in France and the defeated Judaism, and that's correct. So why are they still here? 
Why can't we get rid of them? Why doesn't it? Why doesn't that belief system disappear? Why is it still around? They're such a stiff-necked people, right? <laughs> stiff-necked in a good way. So, I mean, there's so much to really say about it. Getting off on a tangent, but the truth is, there's a tremendous amount, really, of of profound things in Jewish history in in Jewish even with, relationship between Christ, Jews and, and Christ, Judaism or, or the Jewish people in exile and Christendom particularly is, uh, I think there's a lot to learn there, a lot to, lot to examine there. Um, but yeah, so this, this point of this vulnerability, this point of vulnerability and yet being protected and this point of like, it's raining inside. I mean, the sukkah is like the exile in a certain sense, and I, it doesn't say this anywhere. But if you just look at it, I mean, know where that. I mean, again, it, it actually is a common Jewish folk song that the exile is compared to a sukkah. So I wouldn't at all say that it doesn't say it anywhere. In fact, maybe in a certain sense, it's said more than somewhere. It's said by the Jewish people as a whole that this is the case, but. <clears throat> But the point is the sukkah, the, the sukkah, you suffer sometimes in the sukkah. Sometimes it rains into your sukkah. It's cold, but you're still out there. You know? And it's kind of like the exile where the Jewish people were persecuted, but we're still here. Now things obviously have improved, thank God, a lot. But now there's the, now we have separate problems. Now we have the problems of, so I was just thinking about the other day. Something our sages say is, more bitter is the one that brings and entices his neighbor to sin than one who kills him. In other words, a spiritual death, you know, is worse than a physical death. So this came to my mind when I was thinking about the current exile. And I said, you know, I was thinking, because on one hand, I was thinking, well, it's very good. Some things are, the situation is better. And then I thought to myself, but according to this, according to this, what did I try to call it? This idiom, this the paradigm of of being enticed to sin by someone. In other words, someone who pursues another to, to cause him to sin is a bigger destroyer than someone who seeks to cause him harm, even tremendous harm, physically. According to that principle this exile may be seen as worse because it has caused such rampant assimilation. You can say that the, the recipe, <laughs> recipe of an ending to a very difficult physical exile in Europe, going straight into the freedom and prosperity that was available in America was really a test that you know, should I say impossible to overcome and extremely difficult to overcome. It's a recipe for assimilation. Um, the, that makes this exile a very, very, very bitter one. I mean, if you, it's kind of like you have everything, but you don't have yourself. If you have a lot of you have a lot of uh, cars and everything, but you're crazy. You're nuts. It's a very sad existence to be someone <clears throat> who has a psychosis that they think they're someone else, even though they have everything. That's the comparison. That's what assimilation is. Assimilation is somebody who behaves like somebody else, who doesn't know their own identity. They have everything, but they have, but they don't have themselves though. So in essence, they're unaware, they're living, you know, they're, they're living in a dream. It's a little bit like that movie. What was that many years ago? Is about a, a man who was living in a television show he thought was real. What was the name of that? I forget. 
Forgot the name of that. The Truman Show. Truman Show. That's it. The Truman Show. Right. He was living in a world that was not real. I mean, I don't think you can really. The truth is, I think they underestimate. They under emphasize. I mean, I think you can almost have a nervous breakdown when you find out that your whole life was a fake. I think you could have a breakdown. You know, I don't think that happens in the show. I think he, in that thing, he runs away. That I don't remember. It was a long time ago. But I mean, it's a very interesting theme. It's an interesting idea for for a discussion for sure. But um, yeah. So I mean, if you know, the thing is, and I think we all have to really. This is something we all need to take to heart, too. Is like. Because we, I think we all, certain to, everyone to their own extent makes this mistake, like having things is something, but it's not living. First, we have to live. You know, I think it's a little bit of an American psychosis to think living is having things, but living is not having things. Sometimes not having things is living. That's also maybe something Americans know a little bit about the idea of being freedom, you know, the plains, right, the West. Just, ri just riding it on that horse, you know, that's it. Sleeping, sleeping on the ground, your little, your little fire and your little pot of coffee, nothing else. Don't need anything else, you're good. Sometimes I think I, I actually like, uh, I kind of, not jealous, but, uh, you know, it sounds like it's, there's a point there though. Like you're not tied down by, a lot of superfluous things, you know, and not only that, you feel like you can live off the land by yourself. You're not dependent on so many things. I mean, obviously, I don't think human beings have ever really not been codependent, not for, you know, even the cowboy is codependent on certain things. Or even a settler, I mean, you have to, went to the, the, the general store, you know, and went and got supplies and had to go into town and things like that. But obviously people were a lot more self-sufficient. Something that's some some people nowadays talk about how little we know how to really take care of ourselves. But okay, consciousness here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so back to what I was saying, if I could bring myself back about the assimilation, yeah, yeah. Um, I guess again, the point is, you know, how, how that just brings out the point more of how precarious and how dangerous it is in the exile, like how complicated it is for the Jewish people in the exile. And even, even now with the land of Israel, land, of, and that's another interesting thing. Another fascinating thing is the is the story of the establishment of the of the of the um, state of Israel is that you know the Zionist movement believed that the state of Israel would solve all of the Jews' problems. Has it? It hasn't. It hasn't had solved any. It's actually, it it hasn't. Well, a little bit, but it hasn't really solved any of them. Um, it's helped. I mean, again, it creates, how do I say? I mean, I think it does have, it does create a refuge for Jews to go to. However, that refuge is constantly under siege. That refuge is, has, you know, like, you know, 50,000 rockets pointed at it. So it's not really the tranquility they were looking for, particularly one of the Zionist views, and it's not spoken much about now, uh, was that they believed, and this is also a, a bit based, I think, on Christian rationalization, because there was an opinion that, you know, if we just take the Jew out of the ghetto, then we could all get along with him. If he just wouldn't act like that, we wouldn't treat him, we wouldn't persecute him if he just would behave like the rest of us. So what happened? So the, the Zionists agreed with them, and they said, Look, we need to be a people like all peoples. We need to have our own country. We need to be productive in terms of the sciences, in terms of trades, not just sit in the yeshiva. We need to get out there. 
and you know, be a people, have an army, and all, obviously not also not be vulnerable. And the truth is, in that way, they were right. I mean, in that way, how do I say? Well, I don't wouldn't fully say they were right, but I could say at least you can see the point there. You can see the point. However, however, the end of the day, they they did not succeed in turn. That this theory did not prove to be correct. In other words, the idea that anti-Semitism would go away if Jews behaved like non-Jews turned out not to be the case. Um, in fact, today, maybe you could say the majority of anti-Semitism is tied in with anti-Zionism, right? It's tied in with saying Israel kills Palestinians, Israel is an evil country, Israel poisons the wells of Arabs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, Becoming a country and becoming non-religious to a great extent, or identifying not in a religious way, but a secular way, didn't do anything to assist to undo uh, anti-Semitism, it appears. You know, some argue that isn't true. I mean, you know, I, look, I could, I'm just telling you, it certainly didn't, it certainly didn't solve the problem. Maybe it shifted the problem. Maybe it may may make some people think twice before you know really persecuting the Jew Jews in a very severe way because you know there may be people may think you know it that in other words subconsciously there may be a thought well maybe the state of Israel may come to their aid. You could argue that but I, I don't think so. I think it's just the whole world has changed. I think that there's more tolerance in terms of certain things, you know, whether it has to do with changes, it has to do with changes in the Western world and Western thinking, which obviously is in the hands of God. You know, why people, why do all these changes occur? Why do why did it move in this direction? So many different factors, and you can give a lot of different reasons. I'm sure historians do give a lot of reasons, but at the end of the day, it's because God decreed that a different exile would take place, a different form. And, um, and and therefore, and, and that's why exactly what we see now is that it doesn't really matter if a Jew is in Australia or the United States or almost any Western country, um, they don't face, they don't have the same level of freedom and pride as they are in the land of Israel, but they certainly don't face the type of persecutions that created the land of Israel in the first place. Does that make sense? <clears throat> So, yeah, and again, I'm repeating it because it's important and interesting. I think a very interesting point is that the idea that a different Jewish identity would do away with anti-Semitism proved to be completely not true. Okay, so what, what does this have to do with the sukkah? Um, it just has to do with, the again, really, it's just a big elaboration on the vulnerability of the Jewish people, even now, even with the state of Israel in existence, even the state of Israel itself is a sukkah, because it's very similar to a sukkah in the way that there's some protection. You have walls, but it's still shaky. And similarly, Israel is, it has an army and it has, you know, agriculture and trade and, you know, and, and all the structure of a nation. But it has a lot of enemies who are very rich, who have a couple of hundred million people who hate them. That's not an easy situation. It's a very sukkah like situation, a sukkah on a rainy day. That's like a sukkah on a, a, a you know, a, a very, very cloudy day where you're just wondering when is the sky gonna open up and this sukkah gonna get soaking wet. That basically is the state of the state of Israel on a, a daily basis, if you think about it. You know, in fact, one of my relatives said this to me last time I was in Israel, there were rockets falling from Gaza, I think it was. Yeah, mostly it's been lately from Gaza. You know, mostly all well, these wars have been with Gaza. They have like, I don't know what it is, like 50,000 rockets. In Lebanon, that they don't shoot. But anyway, um, <clears throat> so 
I was just saying to her, I was saying, I don't understand because she's secular. And I said to her, I don't understand. Hello? I said, what? I mean, yeah, about, you know, we're strong and we're going to fight back and everything. Why are you letting them shoot all these rockets and everything? Why don't you, why doesn't the secular Israeli army go in there and kick some, you know, and take care of this problem, like, you know, with force? And she's like, no, no, that the whole world is against us. The whole world is against us. So basically, in essence, you know, it's still exile because they still feel constrained by the nations. They can't. They're afraid. It's it's very interesting because it used to be, you know, it's so it's so strange because it used to be that it was there was there was an image of the religious Jew in the Eastern European, you know, exile, his head a little down, and he's you know, afraid, running from running from a pogrom, and that the Israeli was, you know, brave and strong and you know, uh, olive skin from the sun and you know, working with his hands and I don't know what happened. <laughs> I shouldn't say that. They're still, they're pretty strong and they're pretty olive skinned. And, uh, don't mess with the police over there. They're pretty tough guys. And so is the army. So I, I don't mean to minimize it. But at the same time, there seems to be like, there is a degree of, of fear. There is a degree of hesitancy. You know, what does Ignate look? You know, because again, you know, I guess, you look, because from a natural point of view, well, we need Europe for trade. We need the United States. If we get them angry, they're going to be mad at us. and They're not going to do this. And then we're going to be in trouble. And so in essence, Israel is not an independent state in the full sense of the word. <clears throat> yeah, so the Jewish people are sukkah. So what does this have to do with the nations? So again, I guess it has to do with the fact of how you have to approach faith. Let's get practical now. It looks like it's, you know, I've managed to, to speak almost with full class. Um, thanks for joining me. Um, but it comes back to the idea that you have to get out of your comfort zone to, to really have a relationship with God. At least that's the message to the children of Israel. Maybe for the nations, it's, it's okay. Maybe it's enough, you know. But I think the, the, the message, though, is that the Jewish form of faith is going out into the sukkah. The Jewish form of faith is that you don't, you, you, you don't sit in your comfort zone and you, you, you go into a situation in which you're non-conforming. You, you go into a situation where God tells you to, at least, you know, where there are risks involved and you... Um, and you, and you follow, you know, you stay loyal to God's commands there. You follow God's voice in that place. And so, again, I mean, actually, some of your community has done just that. As I think we've spoken in the past about Rod's experience and maybe Sandy's to some, maybe both of you as well. I don't, I don't, I don't really should find out more details about some of the history of the team. But... Um, there certainly is an element, uh, but in general, I certainly know there's, there's certainly an element of that for B'nai Noah who leave the comfort of their communities or, or their, their their families or religious uh, um, uh, churches or what what have you. Um, and that is uh, there's definitely a form of going out into the desert. It's exactly what that is. But um, you know, I guess the question is, what's the next level? You know, as I spoke about in our last last meeting, is is um, not to be satisfied. I don't think, I would hope that it's not that we've come this far, not to be satisfied with just keeping the baseline, no hide, and that's it. You know, we're good. Now we're going to relax under our, every man under his, under his date palm tree, and every man under his fig tree, as it says in the, in the book of Judges. You know, but instead, you know, we try to take things to the next level. So I guess my example would be, for example, um, well, in all the commandments, Tanya says that a person who is, who is a servant of God, 
if he has a certain habit of doing something, he, he pushes to do more. So I think that's a very powerful idea. Because, you know, once you have a habit, then it's not hard. We're just doing it. So the idea is, so we, we do more than what we're accustomed to in some way, or we do something with more intensity than we're accustomed to doing it, whether it's prayer, for example, um, in Torah study, or giving charity a lot more than we're accustomed to. Um, obviously, that's a big one. That That is really putting a person, you know, at first, because that really gets to the heart of, of things, is charity, because particularly in the United States, but all over, like money is where you feel like your your stability is really there. That's your house in a deeper, in a deeper, that, you know, it's like, that's your stability, right? That's your, that could be, you know, your net, your meal or something, or that could, that could pay for something for a rainy day. You know, it's always like, well, I may need that. You know, whatever money we have, that's, that's extra we all feel like I may need that. I, I don't know if I should give that to someone else. I may need that. Who knows what's going to happen? So that's really where you find this, this idea of faith really plays a tremendous role in charity, even for a few dollars. It's a funny thing. Like, you know, we, we could go and, and, and go on a vacation or, you know, we go out and go to a restaurant and we really don't think of that much about the money. Well, maybe some people do, maybe a lot of people do think about the money, but the point is, is that when a person asks for, you know, a dollar, like a little bit of charity, immediately our brain is going to start to, I mean, the natural thing is to, wait a minute, I really don't have money to, I can't give much. It would have to be very limited because, you know, I don't have. And so, you know, how much do I have already? It's not much. So, you know, so this is really an area where a person can can exercise their faith by, Listen, number one, God gave me this money so that I could help others. Otherwise, you know, that's number one. Number number two, you know, is like, don't worry, there's going to be, he'll provide for me more on another day. Right now, you know, I have a lecture and I can give you, you know, because listen, God is not forsaken me. It's not, my God is not in Chase Bank, you know, he's still going to be watching over me tomorrow. And that's exactly what the idea in the desert. The idea of the desert was every day was like, what are we going to do today? Is there going to be food? There was no, there was no storehouse of grain. There was nothing. It was the manna fell daily. And if it didn't fall, they didn't have anything. If they didn't fall, they were going to starve. So that's not an easy way to live. But it's an exercise in faith. Right? So. Another beautiful thing about the sukkah is the idea that you should see the stars, right? So the point is you're always, you're in the sukkah and you're doing human things there. You're eating there, drinking there, but you look up to the heavens. So in other words, you're connected to a higher place, right? You know, again, that's a paradigm of, of maybe the Jewish form of service. It's, it's a higher form but a non-jew can also attempt to do things for the sake of heaven but it's really it, it, it's upon it, it falls upon the jewish people to do this in other words as a betrothed of god really the way a jew should be behaving or, or in a perfect sense is that his whole life that's really the idea of having the jewish code of law is everything is focused towards god even his eating is also focused over there isn't any area of life that's outside he never takes a break there's no break and and really he doesn't want one but that's why everything is done in the sukkah and you can see the heavens so the idea is that there, there is a bridge between heaven and earth and when the person is busy with mundane things but his his mind is aloft you know, at least he's still connected to the spiritual. He's thinking about God, even when he's eating. I mean, that's a high level, but, you know, our nation is a nation of the righteous. In other words, you know, that, that, that's, I mean, in its pristine form, in its proper form, this is the, the service of, of the righteous, the tzaddikim, you know, where they eat in a way that's, even that is pristine, where that's almost, that itself is a mitzvah. They're only eating what they need, they're only eating 
for the sake of heaven, they're only eating in order to make, they're eating more to make the blessing than they're eating for the food. Obviously, that's a very high level. But, but we can learn a little bit from it. We can learn something to try to do things for the sake of heaven, to try to, you know, even in our mundane things. And I think particularly the seven to the, to the nations, this idea that you, you occupy yourselves, you know, with improving the world, working the field, building things in order to make a more civilized world. So in order that, you know, we can be more connected to God in that way. Um, at least at the very least, just through that, the idea that, okay, we're here doing physical things so that we should be more civilized and more moral in the way that God wants, right? So, <clears throat> so it's, it's really, there's, a, there's, a, there's certainly a, tr a big lesson for the nations from that idea. Uh, we're doing f physical things, but the, the roof is open. We see heaven so that when we, the, so well, we could say it this way, in a simple form, the simple to us simple people, the fear of heaven should be upon us even when we're doing regular things, right? Or at least we should try to gear things towards towards a godly purpose, even when we're doing more mundane things. At the very least, we should we should be focused towards, you know, improving society, helping our fellow man, in which we know that creating a civilization that you know, we're reaching out to others. In other words, for example, a person has a business, right? A person has an industry, a person's a scientist. Um, are they doing it to make money or are they, are they thinking about a con contribution to mankind, you know, in a way of helping other human beings? Um, if they're doing it to also to help others, and again, and then taking that to the other step is that this is something God wants. Just like with Noah, when he created the, plowing tools he invented those that was a very positive praiseworthy thing um and it's something that god wants and we should have to we should make the world a more civilized and peaceful place so we can be thinking about that as we're doing those mundane things so those are a couple of lessons of of the sukkah and i guess the point is also is that a vulnerable being in a vulnerable place is not a proof of somebody you know, God not being with the person. It may be an opportunity to be more with God than in a more protected situation, um, which is what is symbolized, part of the symbolism of the sukkah. You want to be with me? Go out. Go out into the sukkah to be with me. So, but interestingly enough, after we have an experience of that of a week, you know, uh, and we added on an extra an extra day to the rabbis add on an extra day. So then once we have that experience, we can go back in the house, which is also another another lesson, you know, like Abraham is, is that even when you're in the physical, but you you know, you should feel like you're you're a wanderer and a stranger. In other words, a feeling of the sukkah remains with you as you go back. Go back into the house, but after the repentance of Yom Kippur, you know, and going out into the sukkah to get away and the distance person from the this mundane living in his own in the home, and to you know, then you once you have that realization of what it all means, then you can go back into the house. So, so anyway, so I guess the bottom line is is that the idea is how to work on faith. And in a way that actually has a repercussion, not just thinking about it, but but pushing the envelope a little bit, doing a little bit more in, in, in something that, even though you guys have already done a lot, I know that, but um, despite that, clearly, you know, you have the power to do it. So let's do some more. <laughs> let's do some more. What else can we do? And obviously, one of the biggest things is how can we influence other people? I mean, really, you know, obviously, the, the Rebbe's, the, the Obama's Rebbe's talks are full of this idea of trying to influence other people. And that we really could all do more of it. We're so busy with our livelihoods and everything else. And also family, hopefully. And family is, of course, the first step is with people around us to, to affect the people closest to us. That's the first thing. So... 
But, uh, you know, to have other people. And that's also part of faith, too, because a person doesn't have faith. It's always worried about their own situation. Oh, my gosh, what's going to be next? What's going to be when I get older? What's going to be tomorrow? What's going to be with my job? They have no time to think of anybody else because they're constantly worrying about their own situation, which is something we see today also. You know, it's interesting that the advent of atheism over so much time, I, I, it does seem like there's not a day goes by now where I don't see on the news that there's some existential, there's like some major crisis, the world might come to an end. I don't understand it. Like, what is going on? But there isn't a day that goes by that there's not some, some news about, oh my gosh, the scientists say that, you know, this is, the may, this may be the end, this may be the end. It's crazy. It's crazy. I don't think, I think people don't even pay attention. I mean, I think, I remember growing up a little bit and I, 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 you know, I was born in the 70s. So it was still a little bit then of the Cold War, a little bit of fear of, of you know, nuclear, uh, mutually, uh, what do you call it, insured uh, destruction. There was a little bit still fear of sometime that could, could God forbid be a nuclear attack or something, you know, with, with the Soviet Union. But generally, other than that, there was nothing. There's nobody worried about anything. And even that was like, you know, and then Reagan and that faded and there was nothing. And now it's like, it's not a day goes by that it's not doomsday. I don't know. But that's, I guess, what happens if, you know, you, you don't have any belief, like, you don't, if you don't believe in God, that there's like, that there's someone driving this bus. There's someone driving the bus here. It's not like we're just, we're not just drifting off a cliff, you know? And, but if you think that we're just drifting, yeah, then obviously, oh my gosh, who knows what's going to happen next? You know, the, the, the whole North Pole is melting and that's it. We're going to be washed away and I don't know, some other things. All right. Anyway, I am not going to steal away any more of your time. I want to wish you a wonderful evening. And uh, God willing, next week, I guess we'll meet you again. It's going to be a very busy week, a holiday week. So, Sandy, maybe be in touch with me. Uh, be in touch on Wednesday, if you don't mind. Okay. Remind me. Okay. Because it's just going to be a very, I'm going to be working. It's the holidays. It's a lot of things going on. Okay. All right. I hope you enjoyed the class. I hope it taught you something that was or a, different, a different approach that you haven't heard. And looking forward to seeing you again. Thank you very much for joining me during this late hour and late day in the week. Good Thank, night. You. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Good night.